The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. When we left off last week, Paul had just arrived in Jerusalem, the very place that God had warned him multiple times not to go. Now, students of the Word have long wondered why Paul felt compelled to go to Jerusalem at this time, and I have a theory which I think is supported by the evidence, and if you want to hear more about that, I invite you to go online and listen to last week's lesson there, number 340 in this series, CSI, Jerusalem. But whatever Paul's reason for going, there seems to be very little mystery as to why God didn't want him to go, and it isn't just because hardships and death awaited him there. Apparently, hardships leading to death awaited Paul no matter where he went. There was no avoiding that. Paul was destined by the Lord to die a martyr's death in defense of the faith. God had no intention of sparing him that. But there was something worse than that awaiting him in Jerusalem. Something so awful, so disgraceful, so distasteful that God would have spared Paul exposure to it if Paul had just heeded his warnings. Treachery, perfidy, betrayal, an act of bad faith at the hands of a church beset with legalists and church leaders who had lost their way because they were more afraid of their brethren than they were of God. Now, this was something against which Paul had been fighting for a long time. In Galatians 1, 6-9, Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we have already preached to you, let him be anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you've received, let him be anathema. And make no mistake about it, these are fighting words. Because to say that someone ought to be anathema is to say that that person ought to be cut off, and not just from the church, but from God. Such is the treatment that according to Paul awaits, or ought to await, anyone who teaches a gospel of laws. Now, when Paul says this, he isn't referring to every varying interpretation of the Bible. No, he isn't sending us on a witch hunt. In this passage, Paul has a certain false gospel in mind, a very specific perversion of the gospel, which according to Paul is so far off base as to set the true gospel at naught. Galatians 3, 1 through 6, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Jesus Christ was crucified by public decree before your very eyes. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? just as Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him as righteousness. Beloved, the number one heresy against which we are warned in the New Testament is any doctrine of works righteousness, any gospel of laws. And Paul found himself constantly at odds with people who just didn't seem to get this. The churches that Paul was planting, many of which had a significant number of Gentile Christians in them, were constantly being infiltrated by Judaizers who were going behind Paul's back and telling the Gentiles that in order to be Christian, they had to first become Jewish, starting with circumcision. This is what was behind the scandal of Galatians 2, 3 through 4, where Paul tells us, But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. This matter arose because of false brothers who were brought in secretly and came in privily in order to spy out our liberty that we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into slavery. And Paul's response to this invasion of privacy and invasion of trust was swift and decisive. Galatians 2.5 But we did not yield in submission to them for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. 
specifically the truth of grace. Galatians 5, 2 through 4, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obliged to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Paul gave no quarter to anyone who sought to set the grace of Christ at naught by introducing law into the church. But when he arrived in Jerusalem, he was confronted with the reality that not all of the apostles were as steadfast in this conviction as was he. Most surprisingly, James, the brother of the Lord, displayed a high tolerance for legalism and a low level of zeal for the gospel of grace. Acts 21, 17 through 22, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brethren received us warmly. But the next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? For they will certainly hear that you have come. And here is where the treachery comes in. Here is where James acts in bad faith by acting on bad faith. You see, James has a problem. And the problem is that he has been playing both ends against the middle, and he's about to be called out on it. Now, if Paul had been of a mind to take James to task for this, he would certainly have grounds to do so. And frankly, I don't know why he didn't, unless, as I suggested last week, it's because he's depressed, because he's feeling defeated, and he's told many of his companions that his life is worth nothing to him, and that he'd just as soon die as keep on fighting the battles that he's been fighting. So when James asks him, what shall we do? Rather than responding as he responded to Peter, when Peter was dissembling, he said nothing and let James keep talking. But beloved, make no mistake about it, James is really doing Paul dirty here. I mean, I don't have time this morning to go into all the details, but if you're not familiar with the story, make a note to yourself to take out the time and read Acts 15 because it's there that we have the record of the Jerusalem Council, which was the first major conclave of the church convened for the purpose of hashing out a major doctrinal issue. And the question before them had to do with whether or not new converts to the church should be required to obey the old covenant before obeying the new. And those who were present decided by unanimous assent that no such requirement should be made. At this meeting, it is recorded in Acts 15, 7 through 11, that Peter stood up and said, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith, now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? After all, do we not believe that they will be saved the same way as we, through the grace of the Lord Jesus? And James stood up and said, essentially, the law of Moses had its day, and that day is over. Let us not trouble those who are turning to God anew with it. And Paul was not only present at this meeting, but he was the one who carried the letter drafted by James, making it official that new converts should not be required to obey the Old Covenant before obeying the new. And thenceforth, Paul had been teaching that very thing and teaching it steadfastly, even though he was greeted with open hostility from Hebrew Christians on this question everywhere he went. And now, 20 years on, James pulls Paul aside and says, now, listen, we've got a problem. Some of these people around here somehow got the idea that you've been teaching the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses and telling them not to live according to our customs. And he presents this to Paul as though this is causing him a problem. 
Now stop and think about that for a minute. How could this possibly be causing James a problem? Paul is teaching exactly what James himself declared should be taught, that new converts, which the children in question are, should not be burdened with the old covenant, but should be taught to live directly into the new. So if James, who now seems to be in charge of the Jerusalem church, has been holding steadfast to the same teaching, there shouldn't be a problem. Because once the decision had been made, all the existing members of the Jerusalem church and every new convert, Jew and Gentile alike, should have been taught this very thing. And it was James's responsibility to see to it that this be done. So if James had done what he ought to have done, Paul wouldn't have a problem. Because every member of the Jerusalem church would know, not just that they have been set free from the law by the gospel of grace, but that this was the gospel being taught by every apostle in every church, including Paul. Not only that, but they ought to have been taught that anyone who attempted to nullify the gospel of grace by introducing law into the church was to be anathema. So why is there a problem? Well, it appears that there's a problem because James didn't do what he ought to have done. Now, we don't know what exactly was being taught in the Jerusalem church, contrary to the gospel of grace, but we do know, because James himself confesses the same, that among the members of the Jerusalem church, there were thousands of Hebrew Christians who were zealous for the law, and whose doctrinal thinking was so out of whack with the declaration of Acts 15 that they thought Paul was out of line for following it. And we know that James has not, up to this point, been willing to correct them, and that he remains unwilling to correct them. And the strong implication of this is that James had thrown Paul under the bus long before Acts 21. And Paul is just now finding out about it, as James shrugs his shoulders with feigned innocence and says, What shall we do? For they will surely find out that you have come. And I say feigned innocence because James knows jolly good and well what he should have done. Because in Matthew 18, 15, Jesus said, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now, there's more to that passage than that, but that's all we need for this morning's lesson. Because optimally, what James should have done, if anyone brought a complaint against Paul on account of this teaching, would have been to come to Paul's defense and say, Yes, that's right. That's exactly what Paul is teaching, and we're all in agreement on that. But, if Paul has offended you in some way, then I suggest you take it up with him next time he comes to Jerusalem. Because that's how our Lord has commanded us to deal with this sort of thing. And if he had done that, then there would not have been thousands of Hebrew Christians who were zealous for the law. Because all of them would either have been corrected, or they would have died on the vine. In my first position as a full-time minister, I served as a full-time worship leader. Now, just in case you don't know, being the worship leader is a lightning rod position. If you're at all thin-skinned or averse to criticism, I don't recommend leading worship as a career path for you. Well, I took just such a position, and I was prepared to receive all the input, good, bad, and indifferent, that came with it. And I did, and when it came, I think I handled it pretty well. Anyway, long story short, things went apace for about a year. Until one Sunday morning when I led what a fellowship with a bit of a gospel swing to it. The response at the time was tremendous and overwhelmingly positive. It was really kind of surprising to me because I didn't think that there was anything very exceptional about it. All I had done was to lead the song the same way that I sing it to myself when I'm by myself. But the congregation was positively electrified by it and everyone who spoke to me about it that morning was elated at the energy of the song service. I left that morning feeling pretty good. And that good feeling lasted exactly four hours because it abruptly came to an end at the elders and staff meeting that afternoon. Because that's when I received notification that the response to the morning song service had not been universally positive. Only those who disapproved hadn't come to me. They'd gone to the elders. And now I was to be confronted with these words. Joe, a, a number of people came to us who were very upset by the way you led that song this morning. And I answered, well, what number? 
And what were their names? Because I take Matthew 18 seriously. And I want to make things right with my brothers, and I can't do that if I don't know who they are. But they wouldn't tell me who the offended parties were because those people had come to them in confidence. Well, I was very direct with these men about the practice of carrying messages in confidence. I asked them, well, why would you not redirect them to obey the Lord in this matter? Your duty, whether you think I'm in the right or not, is to send those people to me. Now, if any of you think that I've done something wrong, correct me, and I will accept your correction. I understand your need for discretion, but when you become the messengers of anonymous complaints, you deprive everyone involved of proper biblical recourse. Well, they got it. They recognized the problem, and they apologized, and they repented of it and later told me that I was the first minister who had ever spoken to them that way and walked away employed. <laughs> but they had been handling complaints in this way for decades, and they honestly didn't know how to break the cycle. But I did, at least in regard to me, and with their blessing, the next Sunday I stood up before the congregation and read Matthew 18, 15 through 18, and said, If I have offended anyone, come to me. I'm right here. I'm not hard to find, and I don't bite. If you have aught against me, give me the respect of telling me before you tell anyone else. And that seems to have resonated with the congregation, because for the rest of my 12 years there, I never fielded another anonymous complaint from the elders. Now, I hope I don't sound too critical of these men. These were good men, faithful servants of the Lord. And I know what it's like to be put in a position where I feel like I have to choose between being loved and being respected. So I can sympathize with them, just as I can sympathize with James. I mean, it doesn't take very much imagination to see how he got himself into the position that he finds himself in in Acts 21. But now that he's in this position, it's still not too late for him to do the right thing. It's still not too late for him to repent. I mean, he doubtless has a written record of the apostolic declaration of the Jerusalem Council on file, and if he doesn't, we know Luke does. And it's not too late for James to gather his Hebrew brethren together and say, I know that I have been indulging your zeal for the law for a long time, but I have been wrong in doing so. And I know that I've been indulging your complaints against Paul for a long time, but I've been wrong about that too. I've sinned against the Lord, against Paul, and against you, and I now repent of having done so. Please forgive me of this wrong. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't even acknowledge that he has done anything wrong. Instead, he presents the problem to Paul as though it's Paul's problem. And how is it that he accomplishes this feat? How is it that he takes this monkey off of his back and puts it on Paul's? What fulcrum does he use to leverage his burden of responsibility off of his shoulders and onto Paul's? Church unity. He says, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed? And the implication is clear. You see, brother, how high the stakes are? But wait, there's more. The best is yet to come, because he goes on. Acts 21, 22 through 24, what shall we do? For they will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. Now, beloved, I hope you appreciate the enormity of what James is asking Paul to do here. In Romans 3, 19-24, Paul declared definitively, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, 
through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through the faith of Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And in Galatians 5, 3 through 4, he said outright that whoever accedes to any part of the law makes himself a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. And now James comes to him and says, in effect, brother, we have devised a ruse, a lie that will get us off the hook. And all you need to do is to set your integrity and the grace of Christ aside for a few days and help us just move things over with our brethren. And then to add injury to insult, did I mention there are thousands of souls at stake? Giving the strong indication that if push came to shove, James and the others would stand with the majority rather than standing with Paul for the sake of the preservation of the unity of the church. And here I'm reminded of the dialogue from Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 4, lines 87 through 91. He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. Tis not fit thus to obey him. Have after. To what issue will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Nay. Let's follow him. Well, for the life of me, I don't know why Paul agreed to do what James was asking him. But he did. Acts 21, 26. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. And in so doing, Paul signed his own death warrant. Because just as James had predicted, when Paul went into the temple, he was recognized. Only the people who recognized it didn't say, Oh, isn't that nice? This man who we thought had betrayed our ways is actually a faithful Jew. Gosh, I feel better about him now. I guess we misjudged him. <laughs> no. Nope. They assumed that he was there to cause trouble. And they accused him of defiling the temple. And they rioted, demanding that he be arrested. And by his arrest, a series of events was put in motion that set Paul on a collision course with an executioner's sword in Rome in 67 AD. And where was James when Paul was arrested? Where was Peter? Where were all the other men who signed the Declaration of the Jerusalem Council? Where were those thousands of brethren so zealous for the law who were supposed to be placated by this demonstration of Paul's solidarity with them? Well, they were nowhere to be found. Not a peep was heard from any of them when Paul was arrested. Why did Paul die? What was the cause of his death? Paul died on the horns of the altar of church unity in a vain attempt to assuage the guilt of James and the other church leaders in Jerusalem to spare them the consequences of the fact that they had failed to teach the gospel aright to thousands of Jewish converts who were eagerly making the grace of Christ of no effect to themselves through their unremitting zeal for the law. Now, some of you may wonder why I'm bringing this up at this point in our studies. Well, we've been studying the life of Christ for seven years now. And five weeks ago, we came to John 17, 11, where Jesus says, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And for the last month or so, we've been discussing church unity in light of this passage and in light of passages like 1 Corinthians 1.10, where Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, maybe my experiences are unique. Maybe my outlook on this topic is jaded. Perhaps I'm even a little cynical on this question. But when it comes to church unity, what I have found is that when I reach out to my left, I am greeted with open arms. But when I reach out to my right, I am greeted with jaundiced eye. 
because to my right stand brothers and sisters who want to get just close enough to me that they can see my flaws. Flaws, that is, according to whatever gospel of laws they have devised. Because even though, as I pointed out two weeks ago, the law of Moses holds no appeal for most 21st century Christians, make no mistake about it, there is obviously a great deal of appeal to many postmodern Christians in law of other kinds. Indeed, I've encountered hundreds of Christians in my lifetime who have an insatiable appetite for legalism and no lack of imagination when it comes to ways of devising new laws to place as stumbling stones before their brothers and sisters in Christ. But in Colossians 2, 20-22, Paul says, If you died with Christ to the fundamental principles of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to moralizations? Touch not, taste not, handle not, all of which yield ever-diminishing returns. Are these not the commands and doctrines of men? You see, as I told you three weeks ago, the problem with the law of Moses isn't that it's mosaic. The problem with the law of Moses is that it's licit. It's jurisprudential. It's statutory. It's regulatory. Moses isn't incompatible with the gospel of Christ. He was there standing side by side with the Lord at the transfiguration. It's the law that's incompatible with the gospel of Christ. Any law devised by men and in my experience, those who are zealous for law will turn on a child of grace in a heartbeat. And this treachery will come when you least expect it, because it will come hand in hand with an appeal for church unity. They'll say, Paul said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you. And in my study of the New Testament, I have discerned a law. And you know what comes next. The law, whatever it is, will be some form of taste not, touch not, handle not. It will be some form of restriction found nowhere in the Bible. Something that could be considered sin only in the mind of someone looking for things to say no to. And the only way for you to achieve agreement or non-division with this person will be for you to affirm this law as he has conceived it and condemn those who don't. Or to put it another way, the demand that will be made of you will be, in order for you to have unity with me, in order for you to be in agreement with me, and for there to be no division among us, you have to set aside your integrity and the grace of Christ, making it of none effect to you. Now, beloved, I don't know about you, but to me, that seems like an awfully high price to pay for church unity. That's the price that was exacted of Paul in Jerusalem. But brothers and sisters, anything with a price tag that high can't possibly be what Jesus had in mind in John 17, 11, when he prayed, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Neither can it be what Paul had in mind in 1 Corinthians 1, 10, when he said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, once again, I've come to the end of my time before coming to the end of what I want to say. Because I have a good deal more I want to say about church unity before returning to John 17. Specifically, I want to say some things about what church unity is and talk about the best ways to pursue it. However, before I get to that, I need to address a couple of other questions first, because Believe it or not, this topic uh, has generated a few emails over the last couple of weeks. And among the responses that I've gotten has been a small number of people who have challenged my assertion that we have a problem with legalism among the churches of Christ. And have asked me to offer specific examples to substantiate my claim. So that's what we'll pick up next week. And that's my lesson for today. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30 and worship services are at 10.30. We look forward to meeting you. Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.